All right. Okay, so there you see the list of people as well. Okay. All right, so today um, we are going to talk a little bit about the kind of like thought processes that should go through your minds when you're thinking of uh, building an entirely new ontology from scratch. So this it's quite a lot of like uh, <coughs> more kind of theoretical stuff in the beginning, uh, not theoretical in the sense of logic, in the theoretical in the sense of like um, uh, principles and practices. And um, in the end, we will uh, go through like one concrete example that we are working on right at the moment, uh, just so to, to give you a little bit of a better uh, sense how um, uh, yeah how, how these principles can uh, are applied to practice. So um, okay, so basically, so I've created as always uh, a guide um, for you to check out. There's link from the Monarch Ontology course notes as well, so you can just click on this if you want uh, and look at it in more detail. Um, I'm going to browse through this guide so you give, to give you a bit of, a, uh, of an overview. And as always, please just interrupt me at all times. So I can see, for example, also uh, that uh, Sarah, who's uh, one of our like um, project uh, people, you're here, you don't know anything about ontologies. I will adopt absolutely, or not much in any case. And I would definitely encourage you to, if you have any kind of questions along the way to just uh, jump in and ask them. So there's no problem, this should be interactive. Um, you just unmute yourself and interrupt me in the middle of my sentence. This is the right thing to do. We're in a conversation rather than in a kind of top front uh, um, teaching uh, situation. All right, uh, first of all, this is a guide to build an OVO, so an open biological or biomedical ontology from scratch. This The principles here do not really apply to many other kinds of ontologies. So there's some very specific thought processes you should go through when you're building an ontology in our wider domain. So when I mean OBO, I don't necessarily mean uh, related to the OBO foundry. I literally mean in the domain of biological and biomedical um, ontologies. Um, and uh, we will discuss some of the following. Uh, so for example, so the first thing we will do is um, to try to hammer into your head a mantra for when not to build an ontology. Uh, this is really, really important. And then we will go through a basic recipe of how we start, like what kind of thought processes we need to go through and make some special emphasis on the kind of different starting points you may have uh, from which you come from building an ontology and uh, also a guide to decide what kind of an ontology you uh, you may want to build. And then we will go through an example uh, process that we are, uh, that um, Sabrina and I are um, uh, working on. Sabrina mainly is uh, working on at the moment. So uh, Sabrina, you can get ready for some questions. Like I, I will do the general walkthrough. I didn't want to throw you in the cold water, but I may just uh, ask you a few things along the way while we are going through this example so you can provide some more detail. All right. Okay, so the first uh, consideration is uh, for, uh, for um, uh, that you have to go through is, is to really make sure that you do not, that you want to build an ontology in the first place. And, the, and the, from, I try to make it as simple as possible. So there are probably other ways to phrase this, but uh, I thought that three simple criteria should be like really in all of your heads when you're creating a new ontology and all of us uh, have, like anyone who's built an ontology has violated one of these, but really in order for the biomedical domain to retain and uh, provide a great um, uh, high quality infrastructure for biomedical ontologies, I think these three are the absolute minimum. Uh, the first one is the in scope principle, uh, so in, or we call it the non in scope principle. And so this means that there shouldn't be any other ontologies that try to do what you are doing. Then uh, there is the um, uh, 
there isn't something simpler or something simpler works uh, principle, uh, which is there could be another thing you could do that is much easier than an ontology. So an ontology is something as you've already learned in the last uh, many months that is quite complicated and hard to understand. And especially the details of logic are really hard to grasp for many people. So if there's something simpler that should uh, that could be used in a full-fledged ontology, then you should do that. And uh, also, uh, and that is one thing that I can like shocked to see most people do not caring about. There should be a glass clear use case written down that could be addressed exactly by the existence of the ontology. So I call this the killer use case condition. So I've seen in the few years I work in Monarch, I have seen many, many submissions to OBO, many ontologies being built for just for the sake of it or for like a very um, uh, minor, not so relevant use cases. And I think that um, that this is like the golden rule, I guess, for everything that we do, but especially for ontologies, is that you should have a killer use case why you need an ontology. And this killer use case nearly always has the word reasoning in it. Okay, let's go in, in through some through, through some of these in more detail. So. Nico, first, before you go, before you you go on, uh, I don't know if you if you think you're sharing your screen, but we don't see the the OBO document right now on your screen share. What do you see? I see the your terminal window, and in the background, I see the the GitHub desktop desktop. Oops. Thank That's you for okay. interrupting me. That's the wrong screen, so no, I. Can't. And I put so the it's... the link to in the chat so everybody can follow, but. For the recording, I feel like it might have been. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That, that was uh, dumb. okay. So I didn't realize. So uh, let me know when when the when it starts showing up. I just you... see you you have you have started to share screen. Okay, here it is now. Do you see the the old book? Yes, yes, and I see the the summary minimal condition okay. to for building an ontology. Yeah. So you're good. Thank you. All right, so um, so first, the non install condition, it's the thing that makes like that is daily business in the Oboe Foundry. It is like one of the huge debates that we are having at all times. So that uh, the question here is, is, is there another ontology that you should put your terms? Like the many people say, oh, I need to add these uh, 60. I have like all these, these different essays, for example, and they're like, ah, oh, and I want to have this nice ontology I built here, blah, 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 and submit it to OBO. But then the question comes like, why did you submit these to, um, to OBI? Or someone else comes and says, here's my, are my experimental conditions ontology. And as you know, experimental conditions can mean about everything in the universe. Uh, and then people will ask like, okay, why don't you submit these terms to the relevant ontologies that already exist in OBO? And then all of these debates, they are like kind of like the main point of contention in the Oval Foundry. And here it is really, really important. If you're thinking of building an ontology, the first thing you should make sure is that there is no other ontology that already has uh, models the domain that you're interested in. Um, so the, there are two criteria here to consider. One is, uh, is there an ontology that covers the entities you're intending to model for your specific use case? So for example, your ontology may contain things like phenotypes, diseases, anatomical entities, assays, environmental exposures, and, 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 and so many different types. And before you want to build your own ontology in particular, before you start adding terms into your ontology that are of these categories, you should be sure that there isn't an ontology somewhere uh, in OBO, in the OBO Foundry at the very least, that already covers these terms. Uh, it is very, very important that you think about this because you, you may think, oh yeah, I'm creating some great terms that help the community, but actually by making these kind of splinter efforts and having multiple ontologies uh, managing overlapping scope, you're creating a huge amount of work for the wider community to uh, figure out which ontologies they should import, which ontologies they need to use, which ontologies they need to combine. So it's a very, very important for us to say, 
really, if there's an ontology in scope, the terms go there and not into your own ontology. Um, and the second thing is, is the subject domain you intend to model. So for example, you may be interested to build a, uh, a model, a, a ontology that covers sort of the Alzheimer's disease domain or the coronavirus domain or something similar. And then, um, and then you want to check, is there an ontology that already um, covers this, uh, covers this domain. Uh, so that's the first golden rule before starting to create an ontology. Then the uh, something simpler works um, condition. So um, there are many different kind of things you can do that are less semantic than ontology. So for example, we are not going into the details here, but what I want to say is, is before you go into building an ontology, the first thing you should think about is is there a different kind of thing you could be doing that is much easier to do and solves your, the same use cases? And this is just a list of things you should kind of like check off and go through. You don't know now what all of these are in details. It doesn't really matter, but just know that these exist. For example, there are controlled vocabularies. They're sort of like ontologies, but without all of the baggage of semantics, formal logic, and all this kind of stuff. They're thesauri, like uh, if you just seek to collate and capture synonyms uh, for your domain in one thing, then maybe some kind of like system for building a thesaurus is more appropriate. There are taxonomies, which are again very much more informal structures, like in, uh, that you can use. In, when I say informal, I mean like in the sense of logic um, that you can use to class, to categorize and classify your data. So typical examples are. ICD-10, uh, which is a taxonomy a tree, basically, of topics. Uh, and for those that haven't listened to many of the other courses in the past, this is nothing to do with an ontology. This is a taxonomy. It's a categorization scheme rather than uh, a uh, logic-based uh, ontology. Or another example here, the United Nations Standard Products and uh, Service Code. So you can check these out. You can see you can unfold them, make a tree out of them, the same way if you do an ontology but they have zero semantics and they, you can't use them for reasoning or semantic integration or any kind of thing like that. But you can use them for data grouping, for example. Um, and then you could have semantic data models. This is a big topic. I'm not going to mention it very much. Uh, if you are interested in this subject, I encourage you to do the very, very nice LinkML tutorial, which covers building a semantic uh, data model and uh, also exporting them into various kinds of uh, uh, data models, like uh, shapes, like Shex and Shekel. You don't know what this is maybe, but it doesn't matter. But these are, uh, these are still more lightweight than ontology. So still more easy to understand, still more accessible to biologists, data modelers, data engineers uh, than ontologies are, but they are already getting to a more complex region and you can do quite a lot of uh, cool things with them. And then lastly, you have um, ontologies. So you have, these are like the, hard, the hardest thing, the sets of logical axioms. If you need re, uh, formal reasoning and only if you need formal reasoning, it, makes it, it, it does make sense to jump into this deep pit uh, of uh, ontology engineering. And you should be aware that this will require quite a lot of frustration, quite a lot of background knowledge of logic, debugging, um, uh, explanations and, 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 and in all of, of the projects that I work on, which build ontologies that work, there are always at least one, if not multiple logic experts that are dedicated to these projects that support the project in sorting out their logical issues. If you are in a project that does not, do not have logic experts dedicated to the project, it is a very risky endeavor to go and try to build your ontology uh, in, in the most formal structure of an ontology. Okay, yeah, think about it in terms of cost. The less formal it is, uh, the more, uh, the cheaper it becomes and the more formal it is, the more expensive it is. So really just take the least possible, the, the least expensive solution that you need to address exactly your use cases. Okay, and lastly, the killer use case um, uh, condition. So this is uh, 
you should never just go and build an ontology because someone tells you it's useful. In particular, you should not build an ontology with some line manager or some project PI or someone anywhere tells you, let's build this ontology or this and that. It's really absolutely important that you, if you are supposed to build this ontology, are 1000% aware of the uh, of the exact value generating function, like the thing that that the use case that is supposed to generate a tangible value for the prospective user, that you are aware exactly how the um, this how the ontology as it is envisioned should uh, realize this value. Make take the time to do that before you embark on major efforts to build the ontology. All right. Let's get, uh, so uh, so far, are there any questions or in particular, are there any uh, concerns or different opinions? Uh, anyone disagreeing with uh, what I just said? Um, then feel free to speak up. Uh, Nico, does the, does the ODK have a controlled vocabulary builder? No, that's a very good question. We would get, if we can uh, get to this, so I, I added your uh, your starting point to the list of starting points, so we can uh, discuss this when we get to this point. But it is not entire. It is not like um, so. First of all, what is a controlled vocabulary? It's very hazy to define. Uh, but we will. Uh, so the ODK could, in principle, um, uh, you could manage a uh, controlled vocabulary in the ODK. But many of the things that the ODK provides just don't make sense. It's a total overkill, all the things that the ODK does for, uh, for most controlled vocabulary development, because you will not need reasoning. You will not need uh, logical validation of any kind. You will not need any kind of like, it doesn't make sense to do like all of these release artifacts, like classified and uh, the classified ontology, which is a standard release artifact. But yeah, we will. We can come back to this later when we get to the uh, different starting points. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So basic strategy and to how to start. You write down the use cases as we've said uh, above. Without that, you really should never start. Um, then you make a table uh, of all of the ontologies and just really sit down and make that table. Do proper research that exists within and outside OBO that cover the your domain or similar domain and document exactly why these ontologies are not suitable for your case and why it is better to create a new one and we will see how how and whether sabrina did that for uh, for the vbo use case uh, in the example later um uh, then the next step is, is you determine whether you have something to start from. We will discuss various starting points in a second, like situations that you might have that could lead to the creation of an ontology and be aware of them and that there are kind of different methodologies depending on different starting points. Um, and then you look at, you gather your tools. Uh, in particular, kind of there are two main groups of tools you should be thinking about on creating an ontology. Is that these are those that support you in curation workflows. This is how do you think of editing your ontologies? Uh, you might have like a, a, a way to to um, edit it in tables, for example. Or you might edit it in Protege, or you might edit it with some special special curation tool or some editor or whatever. Like there are many different things. You should kind of think about what uh, what that could be, and then um, uh, and then uh, how to uh, and your continuous integration and release workflows. Like I still see, like most of the ontologies submitted to Obo Foundry, they have a little bit of A, so they do think about it. Like they have Protege, they use Web Protege or some editor to. Um, uh, to build their ontology and they think about how this is managed. But for B, I see still see, see too many, I would say 70% of the submissions to OBO do not think about continuous integration and releases. And the same way as when you build a software tool, you should think about continuous integration and release workflows. You should in 2022 think about that from the start, like you want to have a process that checks your ontology 
from the first day for quality and uh, you want to have a process that generates released artifacts according to community standard uh, standards from your ontology these things for example for obo and in odk are very well documented but other domains have that not so well documented and you will have to dig and find people and ask them what kind of this what the standards are for these kinds of things uh, but there are many like uh, hopefully we will write about them in the new uh, ODK paper and some of them Sean is researching at the moment um, uh, but just these are kind of like the key, key bit, uh, bits here for you too and then point number five uh, I will tell an anecdote with regards to VVO later um, decide on your ontology ID quite soonish because uh, changing like when you start creating terms with this ID then you create your repository structure which has the ID at various file names um, and then and, and so you it will start seeping into various spots in your process it's very important that you select the ID uh, very carefully up front and for that we recommend to carefully read the OBO ID policy which outlines exactly um, the things that you should be doing, like checking various resources, whether the ID is already used by another ontology, um, making sure it's quite short, it's nice, and so on, but not too short. Okay, so the next thing is uh, we've, this, we've done it in the past once, um, create a basic setup for managing your workflows. Uh, usually this comprises three steps. One is creating a GitHub repository. Nearly everyone does that almost at the start now then you create editors files so these are the files that you seek to edit these could be template tables this could be owl files this could be rdf um, vocabulary files this could be scos files whatever um, these are the ones that you seek to edit and then you have you implement a workflow system or import it or whatever you want to do uh, that does all these things like running your tests running your releases and uh, stuff like that so as i said before odk is one option to do all these things and we have discussed this in the past and there is a tutorial that teaches you how to do this but other ontologies and other projects uh, that are ontology related but not quite like for example um uh, joe was working on the, the an omen uh, ingest where you ba we basically take the Omen database and turn it into some kind of RDF -y re representation. In this case, uh, ODK was an overkill and unnecessary, so it was decided to manage this workflow in a custom make file. And many other uh, ontologies actually use make files, which may or may not be the best way to do these kind of uh, ma workflow managements. Um, uh, to manage the ontology like obi has a very good one and uh, you know, right, uh, disease ontology and some others and then um, uh, lastly you determine the kind of metadata you want to uh, introduce and the logical patterns you wish to build but i'm not going to go into that here this is the main topic of um, of most of the other courses that we are doing when we are introducing how to think about building an ontology um, but I will mention some thoughts when we go through the exact examples. Okay, um, so let's think about different starting points. So there, uh, so when you are um, building an ontology, you may come from very different places. So, for example, there are some people that say, "All right, I have this database here or this data set from somewhere, and I need to build an ontology that covers entities in it." Uh, so, for example, you have a use case in mind where you want to do semantic analysis on your database. So one typical thing you might be want to do is you have this use case that you want to do semantic similarity uh, grouping of your data. So we do this all the time, for example, for phenotypic similarity. So we need some ontology that allows us to um, do um, to find semantically similar uh, diseases based on their phenotypic profiles. Um, um uh, you might have uh, so this is kind of like one starting point um we have uh, already had some kind of basic knowledge in our domain so for example the cell ontology or an anatomy ontology but we need to build an extension so a very typical use case we have is, is that 
someone wants to model, let's say, the domain of some specific uh, um, animal, uh, like a, a sea urchin or something like that, uh, in great detail. And uh, but there is only a very general ontology, uh, uh, anatomy ontology for that as well. And so here we have a starting point that someone wants to build an extension to an existing uh, ontology. And then we have the case where you have already something like a controlled vocabulary in your um, uh, in your domain, or at least a set of like very uh, of commonly used terms. And you want to uh, you want to formalize these in an ontology, and by you know clarifying how these terms relate to each other in particular, to make them more uh, to help with interoperability and the interoperability of uh, data. Um, uh, but here, this is kind of what um, uh, what uh, Sierra was mentioning before. So, but sometimes uh, it. It is the case that actually ontology infrastructure like Protege or ODK or um, or robots or other kinds of pieces in our uh, in our uh, environment are more well understood by us or more mature for certain purposes than other tools that are used to build these artifacts. And then we might just want to say, can't we maybe just use the ontology infrastructure that we have to build something a little bit less formal. And what typically tends to happen here in these cases is, uh, so while you can, you definitely can, and we can also discuss this um, uh, in, uh, in, in concretely, Sarah, if you're interested in this, but while you concretely can actually go and um, manage a normal, let's say uh, RDF SCOS vocabulary uh, in a, for example, robot template, and then just simply use the robots, the ontology workflows that we have in ODK to build that, there are certain kind of weird limitations here. So for example, because we go through the OWL API, all of our concepts have to be either OWL classes or OWL individuals. Otherwise the OWL API, which we use for processing cannot recognize um, what we are talking about. So in particular, a pure SCOS um, vocabulary cannot be managed with uh, ODK, robot, and the typical workflows that we have because they are not typed in the way that they can be interpreted by the, um, by the YAOL API. As it, for the YAOL API, it would be simply an, an empty sort of, uh, an empty file if it gets only a bunch of Scots concept um, annotations, but to some extent, so if you can at least say we are talking about classes or something like that, then yes, you can build almost an entire Scots uh, infra, uh, vocabulary uh, using this uh, infrastructure. You can also use, um, uh, I'm not sure how helpful it is, but you can also use Protege to browse this. Um, uh, but yeah, there's there will be some weirdnesses uh, doing it. I think there might be some better tools uh, for that, but I'm I don't really know, so I would have to check this out for you. Okay, um, uh, other examples of starting points: hierarchical enumerations. I'm not going to into this. Is a notion from data model building, but last uh, and least, and hopefully um, by now people understand that this is really like something that happens almost never again, is we need to build a completely new ontology for a domain that doesn't even have a controlled vocabulary at the moment. So in my kind of experience, this case almost never happens nowadays. So there's almost never the case that there's no ontology that covers the terms in that you are interested in and that you want to build and the hierarchies. Um, and there's always now something to import to extend to uh, interoperate with but maybe there there are some cases where you have to go through this like ancient uh, practice of uh, what is called what is this called again um, uh, uh, knowledge acquisition i love this so back in the days when I was uh, teaching um, tutorials in for like master students, knowledge acquisition was still like a very hip topic because 
um, back then it was but back then I mean this was maybe like 10, 10 years ago roughly or eight years ago so that, that it was still common kind of practice to kind of like make uh, to <laughs> write down the terms in your domain on little cards and then put them on the table and start binning them together and grouping them and sorting them and classifying them and discussing with many others and there are many practices in knowledge acquisition like very it's a very mature branch of how you translate a domain expert's understanding of the domain into an ontology but i have not seen any kind of real implementation of these old knowledge acquisition workflows nowadays sometimes i think maybe we should because they're kind of cool and they're they are fun as well, like in workshops, it's amazing to do these. They're just, it's just the most fun thing. And we kind of did some, you know, in one workshop we did in the first, um, in the first uh, potato workshop, we did a little bit of that, but um, yeah, it's unfortunately very rare now because say it again, it's rare that you need to build and completely new ontology nowadays. All right. Uh, we're getting to the end here from the from what you need to consider. Um, uh, the last thing I think before we get to the example that I want to hammer home, it is a massive bloodshed at Obo Foundry. This topic really problematic, really annoying, and that's why I want more people to understand this uh, this problem. There are fundamentally two kinds of ontologies that exist, and they have very have so very different purposes, and they should be treated very, very differently. And I think that just being able to separate ontologies into these two categories is really, really helpful for understanding what kind of rigor you need for building them, what kind of tools you should be employing, what things to do and not to do. And these are these two categories. They're project ontologies, so sometimes you hear them being referred to as application ontologies, which are those ontologies that are developed to fulfill a specific use case. So for example, they are built to group the data in your project, or they are built to index a search engine for your organization, or they are built to inform NLP applications. It's like uh, the data mining or uh, or, a, some, or an identity recognition or similar. Or they are um, built to populating a bio curation interface in your organization that provides and, uh, and that the organization provides and enables curators to annotate it. So, for example, you are you are you you are working with Poet Monarch's tool for curating uh, the associations between medical actions and diseases, and this tool gets as an input certain terms that it should display. Yeah. So these kinds of applications. Um, project ontologies, so, these, uh, so this is one category. And then there is a category of domain ontologies. And domain ontologies are ontologies whose goal it is to, to model a domain of discourse. And in particular, what they do is, A, they reflect scientific consensus. Yeah? So the important thing here to understand is, is that they are collaborative enterprises. So the moment you decide to build a domain ontology, the moment you should, in your mind, expose yourself to, um, to other experts of your domain and really engage in the debate. Like Mondo, for example, is a, like a masterpiece in this domain where you have an ontology and uh, uh, where we try to reflect consensus and people come and scream, my God, this is so bad. You can't say that the disease is this and the disease is this, that. And then others can and say, yeah, you have to do it like this and like that. Blah, 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 blah. And this kind of debate and reconciling this debate into your ontology, that is like the, a key feature of a domain ontology that you do not have with a project ontology. In the project ontology, you decide, this is the stuff I want to achieve. This is my use case. I shape the ontology as I want and boom, um, uh, and, I, uh, and I create it. In the domain ontology, you should think this is reflecting an entire domain and other people will come and disagree with me and it's my obligation to negotiate with them about how this domain should be modeled okay so the principal um, uh, things are here that we are building everything with reuse in mind 
So very reuse is at the heart of all of this. So we want uh, to, first of all, re definitely reuse all terms from other ontologies. This is something that is also that project ontologies will also want to do. But we also want to provide terms that are explicitly intended for reuse by other ontologies. So in a project ontology, you may just say, ah, I need quickly, quickly to create these 60 measurement terms so that my curators can do measurement. But actually, I don't really want uh, the entire world to start using these terms or complaining about these terms or I'm just, you know, this kind of thinking process is fine for project ontologies, but here in domain ontologies is not fine. So you really want to build it in the sense that um, uh, that it can be used by, uh, by other, by that everyone should be able to use it. And it's very clear, this is the meaning of the term for everyone that uses the term. And there's no kind of like, ambiguity and bad uh, practice or kind of like, you know, rough and ready uh, concept creation or something like that. And um, uh, lastly, uh, where these, these, st these steps you go together, uh, you, the goal is just to create uh, consistent patterns um, that is not only within your ontology, but actually in your ontology and its wider ecosystem. Uh, in particular, you should be logically consistent with all ontologies that uh, you depend on, uh, refer to, import. Uh, yeah, so let's, that, that's been uh, said. So very quickly, just uh, one of the summers because I want to get to the example here. Some things to consider. Very difficult to build domain ontology. Do not do this without a proper sustainability plan and some logic experts. Uh, project ontologies are not bad domain ontologies. Project ontologies can be built with the same standards in mind, and we have ontologies. Um, we are even debating in the Oval Foundry now to admit uh, uh, domain ontology, uh, project ontologies explicitly to Oval. Very contentious issue, so don't quote me on it, but we are trying at the moment. Many project ontologies can have a massive impact, more impact than even some domain ontologies like EFO is a huge ontology project which integrates lots of data, lots of information for, you, for multiple use cases even. So uh, it's not worse to be a project ontology. Um, project ontologies are allowed to change the semantics of imported terms, for example, by adding additional subclass axioms or removing some. Now, if you, there's always this case, ah, I don't like how this person classified this term, like I don't want uh, my, uh, I don't know, I don't want my, I'm just making up an example now, my neuron uh, to be a subclass of uh, brain cell or CNS cell or something like that. I don't like this. Uh, so in, in a project ontology, you can just say, oh, don't care, rip it apart. Typical example, cabbie has this weird branch called bio, uh, chemical role. And in the in chemical role, you have things like acid and uh, and um, amino acid and stuff like that. And um, uh, people say like, ah, I don't care about the difference between chemical and chemical role. I want them to be both together. Uh, you can do that in your project ontology. It's yours. You cannot ever do that in a domain ontology. You should never uh, change the semantics of any of the imported ontology ontologies in any way. Good. Let's go. Um, uh, so do you have any uh, questions so far? Otherwise, I guess you know, we can go to an example um, and uh, maybe this clarifies some of the points a bit more clearly. All right. So um, the example that we are going to discuss here is the building of the vertebrate breed ontology. So I'm just going to quickly show you. Uh, this is the repository. <clears throat> the thing that to note here in this example, and that's why we picked it for this uh, particular uh, case here, is, is that this is a process that we basically just started just in uh, ontology length terms, so a few months back, and all of the kind of like thought processes and uh, decision tree for what we do for which thing, and they're still very fresh in our minds. So when you look at this, this is not an official ontology yet. We haven't submitted it. We haven't, there are still many things to iron out and um, fix. But uh, yeah, this is only for you to understand the kind of 
flow of thoughts that you should be going through. So the first thing is um, the use case flow. Um, uh, so here, um, Sabrina made an excellent thing that I recommend basically to everyone for every project on any subject. Um, she wrote down the use case description on the front page of the ontology, which is super helpful. And just going to summarize the kind of the key two aspects that I just want to say. So we have um, a resource that is called uh, OMIA. So OMIA is the Online Mendelian Inheritance in Animals database, which is, as some of you may be aware, kind of like a pendant to the Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, OMIM database. And um, uh, for animals, and in particular for breeds um, and uh, and their uh, variants, and it says a lot of like, kind of disease information in there and very, various other things. And some of the problems that happen because of this resource evolved over many many years, many decades actually, um, is that uh, all of these kind of names that went in there started to. Be, uh, so, so there started to be duplication, started to be errors, and they realized we need some kind of controlled way to um, uh, to manage this. And in the beginning, I think, like from what I read here, um, uh, this all sounded a lot like a controlled vocabulary. But later, when more use cases evolved, it became clear this, that what they really want is they want to be able to do uh, semantic analysis, not just with their breeds and comparing breeds, but also with their phenotypes, with their diseases, with basically everything that they're doing. So we decided uh, to, um, to build a, uh, a, uh, this uh, ontology here um, for, ver for vertebrate breeds. So now the second thing uh, is, the first thing we needed to figure out is, is there an ontology that can do this job for us? So we uh, took a look, or Sabrina took a look, and she didn't find any ontologies in the oboe palm tree, which is a very important criteria for us because oboe, only oboe palm tree ontologies are committed to the idea of interoperability between ontologies. Um, but uh, she found one that looked applicable, this livestock breed ontology. And uh, I didn't see Sabrina, maybe do you want to say like a word just because it's a very important thought process is what led you to reject LBO and create BBO? Um, did you do, did, yeah. did you look at it? You, yeah. So I, lo I looked at uh, the livestock breed ontology. Um, the big reason to um, not use that ontology is that it is very, very limited to livestock. And um, I think they have, um, what is it, like less, let's say 10, I don't remember how many, I didn't write it down just in front of me, but they have also, they, they have only a few um, um, species that they, look, that, that they include because they are really focused on livestock. And what we wanted was something much bigger because OMIA has, um, information about livestock, but also about pets and about other kind of breeds. So we needed something much, much bigger. And um, also, when uh, looking at that ontology, it the the L the the livestock uh, breed ontology. It seems it's very um, very much like a, a control vocabulary. This. Um, it's let's say it's very simple. There's a lot of information that seemed to be missing compared to the information we wanted to have, which we'll talk later. So, um, like country and things like that. So that was the reason why um, LBO was was not enough. But then it was also very restrict restricted in scope, and we needed something much bigger. So I think that's really the major point why. LBO was not um, chosen. Okay, suitable. Yeah. So basically, you what you had to do, you had in your mind to make a trade off um, between. So your scale was much more. What uh, you had a much higher scale for the kind of terms you needed. So even the initial version of VBO has more than ten times as many terms than uh, 
the uh, LBO and it will also continue to grow. But basically what you needed to think about is, is whether the, the, the effort in aligning with a non obo ontology is work like aligning in the sense of, can you reuse at least the few terms that they have and link to these terms was worth the, um, uh, the effort of, uh, uh, was worth the effort. So maybe in a future state, you will decide, I will kind of like link, you know, create some kind of mappings to LBO. But for now, because of the very, very limited scale, scale and the fact that they are not an OBO, so this kind of, it seems to be the combination and the fact that they are not subscribed to any kind of logical modeling. So it literally is a class hierarchy, which is uh, very limited and not aligned with any other ontologies actually. And you decided that it's not worth to kind of integrate with this ontology as it is, even though it may not be completely wrong or anything like that. Good. Um, all right, so from a starting point, so we have the, um, the uh, OMIA uh, raw data. Uh, is this here uh, the correct table, um, Sabrina? Do you want to say a few things about what exactly came in, like what kind of information you got to start with and then think yeah. about what... Uh, so, so um we we work very very closely with the omia team and um what the omia team had already done is looking at uh, what kind of um information um about breeds already existed so there's this um um this um database let's call it uh, called uh Dadis, which is something uh completely international. It has a huge amount of, um, of um, I am looking at the spreadsheet here, Nico, you can. Uh, so you, can use do you want to one. share? Do you want? Do you, oh, okay. um, that's fine. It, you, you can also. Um, so um, they, they, they had a, um, a list of um, basically everything that was in in Dadis database and basically that list had um everything they wanted to have uh when you are defining a breed so the the name the origin of the breed in which country that that breed can be found um the um the species which species um this breed comes from um and a lot of other type of information including synonyms and this sort of thing so they gave us this gigantic um list of uh, basically all the information that they could find in in Dadis. and um that's that was our starting point and then from that we had to look at the data and uh analyze the, the data. So here on the screen, you see the domestic animal diversity information system. This is uh, where the, the gigantic list came. Um, so we had to um, look at the data and first of all, understand it because it's very, very complicated. And uh, we had to um, yeah, figure out what the data is, what it means, and and what and, and how the data relate with each other. So, um, Nico, do you want me to share my screen? Go ahead. Okay. So. Um, this is already um, the the spreadsheet as as it has been uh, restructured, but uh, we basically got um, this this table that was one of the table that was um, basically this is 
um, the species that um, we're reporting. Um, this is the NCBI taxon ID. So the, the, the OMIA team had already done a lot of work to, to um, map whatever they had to whatever already existed. So they have, um, they had um, um, reference to the NCBI taxon, and then they have also, uh, um, some reference to their, rec the, their personal record in OMIA, and they're also working on having um, the relation to LBO, so that they're working on that. Um, so what, um, we had to, again, understand the data, which was probably very um, clear for them, uh, less clear for us, because we, we are not, um, you know, in, in the field. And what we had to, to understand was how those, those um, how those pieces of information uh, relate to each other. So, here they give us um, breeds, and um, I'll, I'll try to make it very simple, as simple as possible. Um, and we we figured out that in order to to um, define what a breed was, we had to put different pieces of information together. So in this case, uh, we needed to put the breed name, the country where the breed is, but then also add uh, the species and the transboundary name, which would be like the parent of a group of breeds. I make it very simple because, but it's a bit more complicated, but you get the point. We had to figure out what makes um, uh, a term, a simple, uh, uh, an, a unique term. So in order to do that, we had to, yeah, look at the data, put it together. Uh, so that took a little bit of time um, and then figure out who, you know, how you would classify those terms. So as I said, um, we had to first understand that a breed is an instance of a species. So because of that, the parent of a breed would be the species, in this case, alpaca. And uh, we had a lot of discussions and a lot of, of testing, and we figured that the instance of the alpaca breed is the same, it's exactly the same as the one in NCBI. So because of that, we knew we had to use the parent alpaca being the NCBI, um, the NCBI taxon, because it's exactly the same thing. So. So yeah, if, if we created a new term, then all of a sudden we would have in the world two different terms out there that means exactly the same thing and would have different um, ID. So we wanted to avoid that at, at maximum. And so um, we basically created um, the VBO, um, based on the NCBI taxon um, um, classification, basically. So if, so if I can uh, summarize what you see here in front of you. So basically, consider it like this. You get like a data set done in front of you. Thankfully, this one was already in a table form that we could just look at. Uh, the first thing that has that uh, that um, had to be figured out, and that is not always super straightforward, is uh, what Sabrina just described: is what is the identifiable uh, subject for which we want to create identifiers. So you may have said, for example, we cre we create only an identifier for the species and the country, but we post compose the rest. But for our use cases, we wanted to have actually every breed, including their countries, um, uh, uh, into, the, into the countries and so on, being a separate um, identifiable term. Um, then you decide things like what metadata are we, uh, do we need to attach to it? So for example, here we've already started, you can see here that, um, that we have created a robot template. 
this robot template has in column D uh, decides this is our primary label. This is the label we want to put. Uh, I still have some qualms with this label structure here, but uh, this is not that's it's not done yet, so it's not a different issue. And um, but um, then we have uh, things like in column H where we say these are the parents. Here, a very key issue is is that we reuse the terms from up other ontologies uh, as much as possible. So we knew that we uh, have already species terms in NCBI taxon, so we can reuse them uh, for um, basically import them to define our terms. And then we have other pieces of metadata like in column I, where you can see uh, where we capture some of the additional synonyms that we uh, that were provided by our resource. Uh, so th this is kind of like one of the typical processes like in, in case that you are doing and you want to build an ontology for a database it's very this is kind of like how this very often happens like you get, get some data done you think what is identifiable and you think like what kind of logical structure you build what kind of um, axioms uh, what kind of um, metadata you can assert and then after that, you put all of this into OWL, and then you decide whether you want to edit this and continue editing this in the spreadsheet or whether you want to edit this in Protege. Unfortunately, though, we are a bit out of time to discuss uh, more of the details here. So I just wanted to give one chance for one question if there's um, any interest in the audience. Otherwise, please uh, just refer to the, uh, to, the, to the site for further details. All right, no other questions? I hope you're not, you, it's not because you died of boredom, but uh, because you literally were enlightened and understood everything that was said before. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, hopefully then see you next time again. Uh, and if you have any questions and you just want to send them offline, obviously we are there and we can point you to the right things. Um, Sabrina, what would be great if maybe if you could just uh, go through this uh, document that I created on the Obo, Obo site and just fix it a bit. It, I just left some of the things a bit rough around the edges and uh, maybe 